Isaiah 46, verses 8 through 11. Would you please stand for the reading of God's Word? Isaiah 46, beginning in verse 8. Remember this and stand firm. Recall it to mind, you transgressors. Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times things not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will accomplish all my purpose. Calling a bird of prey from the east, the man of my counsel from a far country, I have spoken, and I will bring it to pass. I have purposed, and I will do it. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. You may be seated. We come now to pressing question number seven. How does God's sovereignty relate to my free will? This question contains within it two foundational Christian doctrines, the sovereignty of God and the will of man. Two massive doctrines, massive because of their importance. Massive because of their implications. And massive because of the amount of damage that can be done if one goes astray on these doctrines by casting aside the Bible's clear teaching. Yet, however disastrous that may be, it is even more glorious and life-transforming when one embraces what the Bible has to teach us about the sovereignty of God and the will of man. It will fuel your worship. It will revive your hope. It will ignite your gratitude. It will comfort you in affliction. And it will compel you to press on. However, this topic, more often than any other, will raise many questions in your mind. They may cause tension in your thinking, may pull your emotions in directions that you do not anticipate, and I cannot promise to answer all those questions. I will address some of them, but at the end of this sermon series, we do plan on having a follow-up Q&A soon after, a pressing questions, question and answer <laughs> seminar soon. So save them for then. Throughout this sermon, I will be drawing on work from Pastor John Piper, 17th century theologian Petrus Van Maastricht, and professor of philosophy and theology, Dr. John Frame. But the majority of this sermon is going to be Bible, lots of Bible. We will be jumping all over the Bible, and that's quite intentional. We want to listen to God and let His Word do the talking. So, let us go to the text, lest even from the beginning I say something or import something into that important phrase, the sovereignty of God. It's so loaded, it's so serious, and it is so touching on so many painful things in life that we dare not trust ourselves with the definition. We must simply listen to God when it comes to the sovereignty of God. And we must have God tell us what it means for Him to be sovereign. Isaiah 46, 9 says, I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. So, the issue here is the uniqueness of God. I am God And there is nobody else like me. I am one of a kind, in a class by myself, 
the lone creator. That's the point here. The issue here in Isaiah 46 is the godness of God, the uniqueness of God. When something is happening or something is being said or something is being thought, to which God responds, well, I'm God, then you know what was happening or what was being said or what was being thought is happening or being said or being thought as though we didn't know what it was like for Him to be God. And so he's responding by saying, I'm God. Meaning, you're not acting as though you understand what it is like for me to be God. And now he's going to tell us what it means for him to be God in this text. That's the spirit of this text. I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. And you're acting like I'm not and that you don't know what it means for me to be God. So what does it mean for him to be God? Verse 10 is going to tell us. I declare the end from the beginning and from ancient times things not yet done. So two statements. I declare how things are going to turn out before they happen. That's the first statement. And the second statement in verse 10 I not only declare how natural things are going to turn out, but I declare how doings, things yet to be done, doings are going to turn out long before those doings are done. I declare from ancient times things not yet done. So, events in nature, I've got all that predicted, and doings by the beings who do them, I declare that ahead of time as well. So that's what it means for me to be God. I have foreknowledge here and here. Now, what does he do in the second half of verse 10? The next half of verse 10 tells us how he knows what is going to be before it happens and what is going to be done before it happens. And here's his way of knowing that. I declare the end from the beginning and from ancient times things not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose. So the reason God knows the future is because He plans the future and He accomplishes the future. That's what it means to be God. The future, John Piper says, is the counsel of God being established by God. The future is the purpose of God being accomplished by God. That's what the text says. And now he establishes that even more clearly at the end of verse 11. I have spoken, I will bring it to pass, I have purposed, I will do it. So the reason he makes predictions is because he controls the future. He knows the future because he runs the future. He accomplishes the future. God is not a fortune teller. God is not a psychic. God doesn't have a crystal ball. He doesn't just know the future, he accomplishes the future. And thus he knows the future because he knows what he is going to do in the future. That's what the end of verse 11 says with crystal clarity. When verse 10 says, when God says in verse 10, I will accomplish all my purpose, he means nothing happens except what I purpose. How that follows? Think of this. If something happened that God did not purpose to happen, he would say, well, I didn't intend for that to happen. And we would say back to him, well, what did you intend to happen? And he would say, well, not that, but that. And we would say, so, so that didn't happen? And you just said, I will accomplish all my purpose. And that, that one thing didn't happen? And he would say, no, that would happen if it were my purpose. Because anything that happens is my purpose. Otherwise, I couldn't say, I will accomplish all my purpose. 
I would only be able to say, I will accomplish some of my purpose and the rest of it would just fall down and my word would fail. And that's not what it means for God to be God. Everything that happens, that will happen, that has happened, was purposed by God to happen. Now, some of that can be a bit confusing to just make these statements and then try and pull them apart logically and deduce different conclusions from them. So let's, let's instead turn to the Bible. That's the simpler thing to do. Let's just go all over the Bible and let God speak to us. Instead of just taking the statement and pulling it apart and dissecting it and deducing, let's just listen. But before we do that, let me offer just this one caveat, that when we begin to catalog the sovereignty of God in Scripture, it may be a bit overwhelming and you will then be forced to make a choice. Will I follow in the example of Job and put my hand over my mouth and bow and worship to the majesty of the sovereignty of God? Or will I follow the example of Pharaoh and harden my heart and stiffen my neck and say, I won't believe in a God like that. And what have you just done? Pushed God off his throne and enthroned yourself. So I plead with you not to do that. I plead with you and pray that the sovereignty of God would become to you your only hope in life and in death. We'll divide the Bible up. We'll categorize it into two, two categories. God's sovereignty over the natural world. That's the first category. God's sovereignty. The second category. God's sovereignty over human affairs. God's sovereignty over the natural world. God is sovereign over the most random things you can imagine. Proverbs 16, The lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. If we were to say that in modern day, the dice is cast in Las Vegas, and its every stopping is from the Lord. The arm of the slot machine is pulled, and the dials spin, and their every stopping is from the Lord. Everyone. When you play a board game at home and you draw a card, every card is from the Lord. When you put your hand into that bag of Scrabble pieces and grab another letter, that decision is from the Lord. And unless you think that is trite, Jesus says in Matthew 10, are not two sparrows sold for a penny? In other words, utterly insignificant. Not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the will of your Father. There are millions, trillions of birds in a thousand forests out there and not one of them falls apart from the sovereign hand of God. And Jesus presses that point even further when he says, even the hairs on your head are all numbered. You look like me. That text hits a little different. But many of you have been blessed with a full head of hair. And God knows every one. Matthew 8, verse 2, a leper came to Jesus and knelt before him saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him saying, I will be clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. Disease, the cells of the body, bacteria, viruses, obey 
the command of Jesus. Matthew 8, 25. The disciples went and woke Jesus in the boat during the storm. Save us, Lord, we're perishing. And he said, why are you afraid, you of little faith? Then he rose up, rebuked the wind and the waves. Be still. And there was a great calm. The wind, waves, storm heard the voice of their creator, be still. And the sea turned to glass and the storm stopped. Matthew 8, 28. They arrived on the other side after that storm into the country of the Gadarenes and two demon-possessed men ran up to Jesus coming out of the tombs and they cried out, What have you to do with us, O Son of God? Have you come here to torment us? And there was a herd of pigs feeding at some distance from them, and the demons begged Jesus, saying, If you cast us out, send us away into those herd of pigs. And Jesus said, Go. And they went. The demons recognized the sovereign Lord in the flesh and asked permission and obeyed. In the book of Jonah, God tells the fish to swallow Jonah and it does. God tells the fish to spit out Jonah on the shore and it does. God tells the plant to grow up to give Jonah shade, and the plant grows up and gives him shade. God then tells the worm to come up, eat the plant, to kill it, to make Jonah hot because of his crummy attitude in preaching to the Ninevites, and it does. Bacteria, cells, murderous viruses, diseases, storms, demons, all of them do God's bidding. They're not free any more than the fish or the worm or the plant that just happened to grow up. God sees everything, and if anything is about to happen that God doesn't want to happen, He just says, stop, and it stops. And if it doesn't stop, then He didn't tell it to stop, which means He has a plan for it. Isaiah 40, verse 26 Lift up your eyes on high and see. Who created all of these? He who brings out the starry host by number, calling them all by name, by the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. Scientists tell us that light travels at 186,000 miles a second. Do you know what that means? Every second, light travels around the earth seven and a half times. One, two, three, four, five. Light travels around the earth 38 times. The speed of light is the only measurement we can use when we move out into space and want to measure the distance between planets and stars and nebula and galaxies because we don't have a ruler big enough. So we have to use a light year. A light year is what? How far light travels in one year, traveling at 186,000 miles a second for one year is one light year, which equals 5.865 trillion miles, one light year. So, for instance, if you wanted to visit the Orion Nebula, a brilliantly colored cloud of gas and dust, you would travel at a rate of 5.865 trillion miles a year for 1,500 years and you would arrive at the Orion Nebula. In other words, 5.865 trillion times 1,500 equals Orion Nebula. But in the universe's proportions, this is a close neighbor. We could travel at a rate of 186,000 miles a second for 4,000 years, and we would arrive at Siamese 188, the star-forming region of our Milky Way galaxy. Or moving further out, we could travel at a rate of 186,000 miles a second for 25 million years and arrive at M101, also known as the Pinwheel Galaxy, a beautiful open-faced twirling galaxy. We're going further to 40 million light years. We arrive at NGC 4565, the Needle 
galaxy. And finally, further still, traveling at 5.865 trillion miles per year for 200 million years, and you would arrive at the Hydra cluster of galaxies. 186,000 miles a second for 200 million years. Hydra cluster. And scientists took this picture, and to travel from the right side to the left side of this picture would take you 1.3 million light years. It's awesome. Why are the stars where they are in the sky? Because he is strong in power and not one is missing. I don't know what kind of God you have, one that winds up the world and lets it run and sits back. That's not the God of the Bible. And therefore, it's not our God. From worms in the ground to galaxies in the sky. He is sovereign. We don't have telescopes strong enough to look out into space. We don't have microscopes strong enough to look down into the subatomic particle level to see all the areas in which God is sovereign. Psalm 147 says that He gives snow like wool to the earth, and he scatters his frost like ashes. He sends out his word and he melts them. He makes his wind blow and the waters flow. Have you experienced cold like that? Have you experienced the falling of snow? Or have you run for shelter in a hailstorm? Have you experienced strong winds blowing? That's part of the reason we love all the windows in this chapel while we worship. We can see that evidence of God's sovereign hand blowing the wind. It's pretty still today because he purposed it. But I feel like I'm back home in northern Wisconsin when I read verses like this, where I grew up, the quiet power of winter's cold that can turn water to stone and freeze the face of the deep. One of my friends lived out in the country and his property backed up to the state park and every winter we'd hike down to the frozen lake and we'd take our brooms and sweep off for a nice for a hockey rink. And there's nights where we'd lay out there on our backs till midnight looking up at to the cold winter sky with the frozen lake against our backs surrounded by snow-covered evergreens and oak trees. And you know, when you breathe in in a place like that, your lungs feel like they crystallize when you breathe in that frigid air. Who freezes all that water? God does. Man understands little and cannot control these swirling winter forces. But who does? Who controls such things? Jesus Christ, the sovereign king of the universe. For that's exactly what Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 says. He, Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature, and He upholds the universe by the word of His power. He is sovereign over the whole universe. It cannot get more comprehensive than that, but even more, it's not just the universe out there, but the world right here. Because the Lord said to Moses in Exodus 4 verse 11, the Lord said to him, Who made man's mouth? Who makes him mute, deaf, or seeing, or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Or Amos 3, verse 6, Does disaster come to a city? unless the Lord has done it? Or Isaiah 45, 7. I am the Lord and there is no other. Besides me there is no God. I form light and create darkness. I make well-being and create calamity. I am the Lord who does all these things. Do you wince at those verses? 
Are there preachers and pastors and whole ministries that are ashamed of verses like that? Indeed there are. They would take away the only hope for people in suffering. God didn't have anything to do with that. That was outside of His plan. Foolishness. He is not the author of evil. But He is sovereign over it. 1 Peter 4.19 says, Let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator. Or 1 Peter 3.17, It is better to suffer for doing good if that should be God's will than for doing evil. Or listen to Deuteronomy 32.39, See now that I, even I, am He, and there is no God besides me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal, and there is none that can deliver out of my hand. The roll of the dice, the fall of a bird, the crawl of a worm, the movement of the stars, the falling of snow, the blowing of wind, the loss of sight, the suffering of the saints, and the death of everybody are included in the words in Isaiah 46, I will accomplish all my purpose. That's the natural world. What about human affairs? We're in an election season. Did you know that? Daniel 2, 21. Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. Whoever the next president is, they will not be sovereign. They will be ruled. They will have authority, but it will be a delegated authority. It will be a delegated authority given to them by the Most High God, and they will ultimately be accountable to Him. And we should pray that they will right now acknowledge that accountability. From local school boards, to the sheriff, to county commissioners, representatives, senators, governors, Supreme Court justices, and the President of the United States, by His sovereign hand, God sets them up and takes them down. The king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord, and He turns it wherever He will. Proverbs 21.1. When the president travels abroad on foreign affairs and meets with heads of state, Psalm 33, the Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing and He frustrates the plans of the people. Psalm 2, why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth, they set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed, saying, let's burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Psalm 115, why should the nation say, where is your God? Our God is in the heavens and He does all that He pleases. When nations gather together to do their worst, have they slipped out of God's control? No. They are under the sovereign hand of God. How do you know that? Because when the nations gathered together to carry out the worst evil this world has ever seen, God was in control. Acts 4. Truly, in this city, 
Jerusalem, there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. There was Herod, there was Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel. The nations take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. Acts 2, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. As you yourselves know, you saw his signs and wonders. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men, but God raised him up. Divine sovereignty and human responsibility. The Bible has no problem smashing those together in the same verse. All of it was sin. Killing the Son of God is the worst sin there is. Yet, while they were at their worst, they were at the same time more firmly in God's control than anywhere else. And God, in the moment of their greatest sin, thereby destroyed sin. The cross of Christ, the greatest evil predestined by the sovereign hand of God to be the instrument whereby He would destroy Satan, sin, and death and reap a harvest of redeemed souls from every tribe, tongue, and nation, a countless multitude redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. In The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, you remember C.S. Lewis says, when the white witch killed Aslan, she didn't know that there was a deeper magic at work. people and the nations had gathered together to kill the Son of God. That was their will. But there was a deeper, more sovereign will at work in that evil to turn it for the greatest good this world could ever know. You need a category in your brain for God willing that sin be without himself sinning. God willing that that sin would happen without himself being a sinner. If you don't have that category, this text could make no sense to you. And it is so precious because we have no Savior apart from the sovereignty of God. Now, if you are a Christian, if you are in Christ, there may have been a hundred horrible things in your life to this point. And if today you are moved to treasure Christ as your Savior and Lord, you may write over all 100 of those horrible things that have come into your life to make life so horrible at times. You may write over it, Satan, you meant all of this for evil, but God meant all of it for good. That's Genesis chapter 50. You meant all of it for evil. God, you meant all of it for good. And now, from this day forward, I aim to see as much of what he's done in and through my life and all the horrible things that have happened to me. John Piper says, I aim no longer to devote myself to murmuring or criticism or anger or bitterness, but rather I aim to listen to his voice and ask, God, what do you want to do to make of my broken life? from the roll of the dice to the circuits of the stars to the rise of presidents to the death of Jesus to the gift of salvation he accomplishes all of it according to his will what about my free will 
That is, after all, the question at hand. How does God's sovereignty relate to my free will? If God is absolutely sovereign, doesn't that just make me a robot? Doesn't God say, choose you this day whom you're going to serve? He's telling us to make a choice, right? My will is free to choose, for Christ or against Christ. Indeed, God does address us as free moral creatures. And we are accountable for our actions and our thoughts and our attitudes. We are accountable and we are liable to His divine authority. We are morally responsible for our choices and we are free to choose. But we are free to choose according to our nature. We are not absolutely free. We are free to choose according to our nature and therein lies the problem. For the Bible teaches that our nature, our will, is in bondage. It is enslaved. The Bible teaches the absolute enslavement of the human will to sin. Natural man left to himself, apart from Christ, will never choose Christ. Indeed, he cannot. Why? Romans 3 says, None is righteous, not one. No one understands. No one seeks God. Everyone is turned aside and together have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Jew, Gentile, does not matter. John 3.36 says that whoever does not believe in the Son, divine wrath remains on him. It remains. It didn't come and arrive. It remains. It was there. Natural man, apart from Christ, divine wrath rests on you. John 3, this is the judgment that light has come into the world and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. The problem with your will is not that light is lacking. It's that natural man enslaved to sin loves the darkness and hates the light. We do not sin out of duty. We sin out of nature because we love the darkness. Or Romans 8, 6. To set the mind on the flesh is death, for the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It doesn't submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Those are heavy, weighty cannots. It is a real bondage, this mindset, this disposition that is hostile to God. We don't have to learn it. It's insane to be hostile to God. You can't win. Well, of course, the world is insane. Why is it hostile? Because it doesn't submit to God's law. It cannot, because it cannot. Everyone hates God in their natural state. That's what this text says. And you have to test that theology against real life examples. The 80 year old, nice, kind grandma who doesn't believe in God or Christ. According to this text, she hates God. This is where the offense of the gospel comes in and why natural man hates it because of the Bible's evaluation of us left to ourselves. Ephesians 2 says that you were dead in your trespasses and sins, and you were following the course of this world. The picture in Ephesians 2 is not that Jesus comes walking by a playground full of kids that are playing on the, all the equipment, and He calls out to them, come and follow me, and some of them say, yeah, I'll do that, and some say no. The picture is that Jesus walks by the graveyard and says, come and follow me, and apart from the sovereign, life-giving voice of the Lord, everyone remains in their graves, dead in their sin. 2 Corinthians 4 says, In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing 
the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. In our sin, left to ourselves, by ourselves, we are blind to the glory of Christ. Natural man, apart from Christ, is not free. He is a slave. A slave to sin. He stands under the legal condemnation of God. He loves the darkness. He has a mindset hostile to God. He is spiritually dead. And he is blind to the glory of Christ. That is the evaluation of the New Testament. So left to ourselves, we are without hope. We will not choose God because we cannot choose God. We are dead and we cannot resurrect ourselves. Some of you here today are dead in your trespasses and sins right now and the wrath of God hangs over you. And I would plead with you today to turn to Christ and have all of your sins forgiven and enter into new life eternally. Turn from your sin and trust Christ. It's the only way to be saved. We are dead and we cannot resurrect ourselves, but we serve the God of Lazarus. When Jesus showed up at the grave of Lazarus after Lazarus had been dead for four days, he didn't show up, sit down, wait for Lazarus to raise himself from the dead. No, the sovereign Lord in the flesh spoke to that dead man and dead Lazarus obeyed. Death obeyed Jesus, and Lazarus came back to life. Now, when Lazarus came back to life and walked out of that grave, did he have anything to boast about? No. Did he think to himself, well, I must have had a pretty good-looking corpse for Jesus to raise me from the dead? No. Did he think, well, I must have contributed something to this resurrection of mine? No. But God who is rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and he raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Why? So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. And just so we don't miss it, he says, for by grace you've been saved through your faith. It is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works or anything that you've done so that no one may boast. He saves us in such a way that it excludes all boasting and he makes no doubt about it. God from beginning to end. What shall we say then to these things, Roman 8 says? If God is for us, who can possibly be against us? He didn't spare his own son, but he gave him up for us all. How will he not also along with him graciously give us everything? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? Who is going to charge you? It's God who justifies. Who is going to condemn you? Christ Jesus is the one who died, and more than that was raised to life. And he's interceding for us. Who could possibly separate you from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? Are those outside the control of the sovereign hand of God? No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Because I am sure, Paul says, that nothing, neither life nor death, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers or height or depth or anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God which is ours in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's why at the end of those chapters in Romans chapter 11, Paul just bursts out into worship, tracing all these great truths of the sovereignty of God. The, oh, the depths of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God, he says. How unsearchable are his judgments and inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Who's been his counselor? Who's given him a gift that he might be repaid? For from God and through God and to God are all things. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And we, ha we haven't even touched on the book of Job or Ephesians chapter 1 or Romans chapter 9. 
If you're wrestling with this, struggling with how to put all this together, take comfort in the fact that Spurgeon said, the sovereignty of God and man's responsibility, they're like two lines that appear to be parallel. They just never touch. We don't understand how they go together, but someday in eternity, they'll cross. So let me close with a quote from Spurgeon. He says, that there is no doctrine more hated by worldlings, no truth of which they have made such a football, something to kick around, as the great stupendous but yet most certain doctrine of the sovereignty of the infinite God. Men will allow God to be everywhere except on His throne. They will allow Him to be in His workshop to fashion worlds and to make stars. They will allow Him to be in His storehouse to dispense His gifts and bestow His bounties. They will allow Him to sustain the earth and bear up the pillars thereof, or to light the lamps of heaven, or to rule the waves of the ever-moving ocean. But when God ascends His throne, His creatures gnash their teeth. And when we proclaim an enthroned God and His right to do as He wills with His own, to dispose of His creatures as He thinks well, without consulting them in the matter, then it is that we are hissed and cursed. And then it is that men turn a deaf ear to us, for God on His throne is not the God they love. They love Him anywhere better than they do when He sits with His scepter in His hand and His crown upon His head. But it is God upon the throne that we love to preach. It is God upon his throne whom we trust. It is God upon his throne of whom we have been singing this morning. And it is God upon his throne whom we will worship with glad hearts for all eternity. Amen. Make it true of us, Lord, that your sovereignty would be the foundation of our hope. That it would exclude all boasting. That it, would, that it would be a comfort to those <clears throat> in affliction. And that it would drive those who are outside of Christ to flee to Him for salvation. You are the only hope we have. We praise You and we love You. Amen.